Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this time we are going to be sharing our favorite Black authors and illustrators as part of February being Black History Month. And of course, we do want to make a note that February is definitely not the only time that we are sharing Black authors or people of color um, as authors or illustrators. But because we probably don't share them as often as we should, we want to give special emphasis during this month. And so if we talk about any titles that you are interested in getting your hands on, um, there are several ways to go about doing that. The first is to contact your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and talk to the staff there and they'll be more than happy to assist you. The second, if you prefer to do it on your own, you can go to our website and request physical versions of the titles, hardcovers, paperbacks, CD audios, and large print. That website is on your screen now. If you're interested in a digital version and it is listed on the screen as being available that way, there are two different apps. The first is Overdrive, and you may hear refer that referred to as Libby as well. And there are downloadable eBooks and audiobooks available there as well as magazines now. And there is also Hoopla, which has downloadable eBooks and audiobooks and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the fabulous thing about Hoopla is that there is never a wait for any of the items that you see listed there. And now we will go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Jennifer Grineski, and I am the Community Librarian at the Dundee Branch. And our introductory question for this week is how did you first hear about one of the authors or illustrators that you are going to be sharing? And I'm going to be talking about James McBride as one of mine, and he's amazing and fabulous. And oh, I forgot to write the year down. I want to say it was like 2013, but I could be completely wrong on that. But he was chosen, his book, The Color of Water, was chosen for the Monroe County Library, the Monroe County One Book, One Community Read. And so I read that book and also had the opportunity to go and hear him at Monroe Community College when he came to speak. And the book is amazing. He's a wonderful public speaker. And then when his next book came out, I don't remember if somebody had read it prior or we just chose it based on how much we enjoyed The Color of Water. Um, our book club chose to read The Good Lord Bird. And I will talk more about that later because I could go on and on about that book because it's amazing. So that is how I heard about one of the authors or illustrators that I chose. Also with us this week is Kelly Beister, who is the branch technician at the South Rockwood Library. And Kelly, who was one of the authors or illustrators you chose and how did you hear about them? So anyone who knows me knows that I love Jason Reynolds and um, everyone in my family now is obsessed with him because of my obsession with him. But I first found him um, at an Allen um, conference. It was a conference put on by the NCTE. It's a group of um, educators and publishers and um, they have panels of authors and you get free books and it's amazing. Um, but I first met him at a um, publisher dinner. I um, I think I presented that year um, a, a panel or a, a breakout session I presented and so the publisher invited me to dinner and I got to sit with him and I talked with him and um, he is absolutely amazing. And so after that dinner he spoke the next day and everything that he said I still hanging on his words to this day like I've read everything like I just love him I'm trying not to gush so much so that I can gush when it's my turn to talk about this <laughs> this, is, this is the pre-gushing session yes. I realized that when I started talking about James McBride I was like oh now I just want to tell you all about how amazing I find his writing um but I know I, but I'll say I that <laughs> so. yeah so Jason Reynolds he's my guy and I met uh, yeah I, I got to know him at a conference personally I mean, I <laughs> kind of a big deal <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Also with us this week, we have Jen McCarty, who is a reference librarian at the Ellis branch. And how did you hear about one of the authors or illustrators that you're going to be sharing with us, Jen? Who to choose? Um, so one of the authors I'm going to talk about is N.K. Jemison. Um, and I found her by uh, my book club, picking books a couple of years ago. I think we did the book that I'm going to talk about in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted, for some reason that year when we were selecting our books, we vote on them. 
but inevitably I end up being able to just pick a few. Um, and we had a we had a lot of science fiction that year, and I wanted some more fantasy. And so I was looking at fantasy lists and authors, and I came across this female author, and I'm like, well, there aren't that many female fantasy writers. So mm, she's won some awards. She's going on the list. And it wasn't until I started reading more about the book that I discovered that she was also African American. And I'm like, okay, I've been trying to make sure that we read a more diverse panel of authors. So I'm like, female, a minority, like. This is amazing. And then the book is incredible. <laughs> so <Even that. laughs> I, I, she's become one of my favorite authors. If you like fantasy, she's incredible. And I will also gush a little bit more about her when it's my time. But that's I, I discovered her purely by accident, um, just trying to find another fantasy book to add to our book club. Nice. Accidental finds are amazing when they come along and you're just like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know this was out there, especially if they have a lot of like works that they've done because then you can go back yeah and, and she has done a huge amount but what she's done is so good <laughs> so fun. i've got her on my list but we'll get to that later see it's real hard not to get into it now um also with us this week is isabella arnold and how did you hear about one of your authors or illustrator choices so um one of my favorite illustrators is Christian Robert Robinson and I first discovered him when, uh, when I was processing so I process books through the library I'm the one who puts on stickers and tape and stamps the tops and um, so we were processing a whole bunch of children's books for the bookmobile um, two years ago this April and so all the bookmobile collection is like everybody's favorite children's books and everybody's favorite YAs and J's. And so I, this title came through You Matter, which is right next to me right there. Um, and it was just adorable. Like I loved it so much. And then they got the box book, book of it for the bookmobile. And I just thought the illustrations were adorable. And then um, when I was working on the thousand books before kindergarten with my son right now, um, I would just go and get all of his backlog of books. Um, and they're all so, they're just so adorable. They're illustrated so well. Um, and so I discovered him through the Bookmobile, which is awesome. Been on it, you should. <laughs> <laughs> nice, thank you, Isabella. And also with us this week is Bonnie Jennings, who is a clerk and a retired school librarian for the Dundee schools. And how did you hear about one of your chosen authors or illustrators, Bonnie? Well, I chose Sharon Draper, who I heard about her. She was a speaker for one of the county's uh, young author conferences, and which I did not get to go to meet her because I was at school. But um, uh, the administrator there, John Crimmel, who was a wonderful administrator and still is from what I can gather, um, he said, I'm going to dig up some money somewhere so we can stock some of her books. We need to have these kids reading. He's very um, good about getting money in the right places. And so then I started reading her books and, you know, trying to get the kids to read them. And um, so I did find in the front of the book that I'm going to talk about later, um, she has a grandfather, an actual grandfather, who was a slave, which seems unbelievable, but he was, um, I put some notes, he was uh, married four times. He was five years old when the Civil War ended, so he was a young slave, but he was still a slave, married four times, 21 children, and Draper's dad um, was born when her grandfather was 64 years old. So that's how I would bet she's one of the few people who have a grandfather who was a slave. Um, so she um, she doesn't write just about slavery and that type of issues, but she does write about a lot of issues um, that are very interesting and well done for um, middle school age and even older. So you'll hear more about her. I'm the same way, I, you know, she just seems so interesting and I wish I would have gotten to meet her, yeah. but I didn't. So. Thank you, Bonnie. And to get us started talking about our favorite black authors and illustrators, let's have, let's have Jen start. All right. It's cat club. Sorry. <laughs> I, wanna, I wish I could just put her right in front of my face. I am not a cat. 
All right, you're gonna leave me? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so let's start with let's start with N.K. Jemison. Um, the book I want to talk about is called The Fifth Season. It is the first book in the Broken Earth. I'm trying to see if it says that on there. I think that's correct. The Broken Earth trilogy. Um, this is. <sighs> I love picking these really complicated books to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just read a review this morning. I was like, okay, I need to like catch back up on this. It's been a while since I've read it. Like, let me, you know, kind of read some things. There was a review um, by NPR where they were discussing this book and they said there are two ways you can look at a book that has a glossary. Either people really, really love it and they're like, yay, this author put a lot of hard work into this. It has an index, it has a glossary. Or you're like, what? <laughs> um, and this book does have, this book has two glossaries. Wow. It's intense in the world building, um, but she does it so well that you're like, oh, thank you. Thank you for the glossary. So this book is set, this trilogy is set in a world called The Stillness, which is actually um, a kind of a bizarre name for it because it's actually constantly in upheaval. They have what they call fifth seasons which every couple of centuries, basically there's an apocalypse and most of the people die. And it's usually some kind of crazy like weather change or um, seismic change that completely re, you know, reworks the land, reworks the population. Um, and they are at the very beginning of a new fifth season. So the world is basically being thrown into upheaval. And so this particular book follows three different women who all have special powers. There are people within this world, they're called orogenes, that are, um, most of them can do things with earth. So they can control the earth, they can control different different ways they can control it. And the people who have this power are kind of second class citizens as, as they're being used for their power. It's, you know, it's one of those worlds. Hey, you're not as good as us, but let but, but we need to do all the heavy use everything you have. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this book follows three different women at different stages of their lives. Um, the first character you meet is going on sort of a pilgrimage after her children are murdered, and she thinks one of them might still be alive, but she's not really sure. And you have three three different women who are in totally different places and you don't really know how they relate to one another until you get further into the book. Um, it's definitely complicated. It's high fantasy. It's got two different glossaries. This is not a light reading book by any standard, um, but if you like fantasy, if you like really elaborately, incredibly well done worlds, this series is impeccable for that because it's she's put so much thought and care into the world that I mean no detail is left unspared it's almost Tolkien-esque in the I've created this world so completely um you know if, if you like that sort of fantasy this book is so good um and I'm excited for she has a new book that just came out called The City We Became um, and I immediately put it on my book club list for this year. I was like, so we're reading N.K. Jemisin again. I don't really care if you guys want to. We're doing it because <laughs> I like her and I want to read this book. Um, but she's just a wonderful author. And one note I kind of wanted to make when we did read her for book club and I was reading some different interviews with her, she actually really bristles at being considered an African-American author. She's like, yes, I am, obviously. But that's not all I am. <laughs> like if she goes into a bookstore and her books are in a bookstore or a library that has like an African-American fiction section and that's where her books is and they're not like if they're separated by genre and they're not with fantasy, it makes her mad. And I can completely see that because this book is incredibly good fantasy regardless of who the author is. Um, but the fact that she is a female minority writing in this very white man space and she does it so, so well. Um, I, I, you know, if you're someone who's like, I know some guys, sorry guys that might watch this, are like, oh, I don't want to read a book by a girl. Well, first of all, that's just dumb. And second of all, this, if you are a fantasy reader, she's amazing. Just ignore that. And that's probably why 
it's N.K. Jemison and, you know, initials instead of, like, yeah. her full name, which I'm not even sure what it is, honestly. But so good. So, 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 so good. So that's <laughs> that's my first book. Um, my second author is Jacqueline Woodson, who is a really popular author. She's done a lot of young adult stuff. She's done a lot of J stuff. She's done a lot of, she's done some kids things. Um, I first came to her through, she writes a lot of books in prose, which is like poetry. And she's a beautiful, beautiful author. Um, the way she uses language is just incredible. And um, one of her more famous books is called um, Brown Girl Dreaming, which is lovely. But I wanted to share this one. Um, it's called The Day You Begin. And she wrote the words to this. Um, it's illustrated by Rafael Lopez, who is a Latino uh, illustrator. Um, but it's just so, I love this book because I think every kid can relate to this book in some way. It starts off, and I know we have a picture. I don't remember which one I sent you. <laughs> um, but it starts off, there will be a time when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. Okay, this is towards, the picture I chose is towards the end. But it goes through the different ways that you might be a little bit different. Maybe it will be your skin, your clothes, or the curl of your hair. Um, they point out a girl who's eating a different lunch. Like, ooh, what is that? No, you can't see the rice under the kimchi. That's it's the most, rice is the most populous dish in the world. Um, the the one boy here on this page, Rigoberto, speaks Spanish. And he's different because his family just moved here. But it goes through as you begin to share your stories with each other, you realize you have more in common. And that even though we all might be different and we all may maybe look different or have a different culture or speak a different language, there's always things that are going to unite us. So um, I think that's such a, just such a wonderful message. You know, obviously this is a kid's book, but it's a wonderful message for everybody that I think we all can have that feeling. Sometimes we're, you know, obviously we're, we're five women sitting here talking about books, but there's times when we walk into a room when we might be the only woman. There's times when you walk into a room and you might be the only person of color or you might be the only person dressed a certain way um, or you might be, you know, going on to a different country and you're the only person speaking that language. But if you can still figure out a way to communicate with each other and learn from each other, there, we're, there's, we're way more similar than we are different. And so I love that idea that in this particular book that it explores when you begin to share your stories with each other, you begin to talk to one another, there's always going to be something there. And then that just creates a beautiful thing where we get to learn more about each other and appreciate, yeah, you're different this way. Your lunch might be different. You might speak a different language, but we have more in common than we have a difference. And so I just, I just love, 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 love this book. It's just a wonderful, wonderful book. And Jacqueline Woodson is an incredible she's so gifted with just language and words and she's a wonderful author and i would recommend any of her books i second that jacqueline woodson is amazing brown girl dreaming was mm -hmm. incredible and um i gave it to my son and when he saw that it was in verse he was like and i was like just try it i said give it just two or three pages and then he read the whole thing and he was like that wasn't bad at all because i yeah, think you know, just looking at it and thinking oh it's poetry that feels yeah. intimidating and, but once you read it it's so and and the story that she's telling about growing up and struggling in school and then you know that she becomes this amazing writer it, it's just such a good book and she, she has she has a lot too. out there so yeah thank you thank you jen and let's have bonnie share her books with us next all right first one i'll start with um copper sun by sharon draper is that the first on the slide you can pick either one oh uh, okay i can pick elijah <laughs> um uh, elijah of um buxton is by christopher paul curtis who is another wonderful author for children um he's a flint native so he's a michiganian um oh, and i'm from flint yes <laughs> yeah shout out to flint so some good things come from flint that's right um <laughs> but he he has written somebody some several newberry winners and honors and coretta scott Skint 
Coretta Scott King's award. Um, but Elijah Buxton um, is based on a true place in Canada, Buxton, and Elijah um, is the first freeborn child in this settlement. Um, and he also in his book, I love it when they talk about the real place where it came from. Buxton is still there. You can visit it. Um, at one time it had 1,500 to 2,000 um, escaped slaves there. Um, and it was run by a pastor who um, really made a success of that settlement because he, when they moved there, um, the families had to purchase some land with a low um, rate of interest. And so they got some ownership of their land. But anyway, Elijah, uh, just because he's free and the people that the adults that are there have escaped um, slavery, they are not really free because slave catchers, uh, they still had to be on the lookout for slave catchers, even in Canada. Um, money was involved. Um, and, you know, so they all, so the book has that fear in there. And then the ones that were there, uh, especially one that is named was Leroy, Mr. Leroy or Leroy, um, he's saving his money because his wife and children are still slaves. So he's saving money to hopefully one day buy his children. Um, the whole book is funny, it's well written with his dialect and doing the things that kids just do. Um, to irritate adults, and Elijah has a lot of spunk, and it, it would be, it is a great read aloud for kids. Um, it does deal, though, with some real tough subjects. Um, at one point, um, Elijah uses the egg N-word in front of Mr. Leroy, who smacks him right down because as an escaped slave, he had been called that, and he wants Elijah to know we don't, we're not doing that. We're not disrespecting each other or anyone else. Um, so it was a hard lesson for Elijah to learn, but he did. And he um, wants to help Mr. Leroy. Um, and along the way, they are also, there's a carnival in town. Um, so there's a lot of side excitement. And there is a, a real shyster of a preacher who um, basically steals, he steals money from the town. Um, he does redeem himself towards the end. I don't want to give that away. Um, there's some real sadness, though. Um, Elijah learns about, you know, he sees scars on people from their brands um, when they're branded like cattle or whipped. Um, but it's done in a way, um, I think you could even, you know, third or fourth grade could have this read to them. Um, he talks about it, but he doesn't go into the terrible details of it. Um, there is some death also to someone very close to Elijah, um, but through it all, um, the strength and the will of those people um, was amazing, and I, I would recommend this book. He he has another one after this, um, The Mad Man of Piney Woods or something, ex I forget the exact title, but it also deals with um, some of the things that happened besides being a slave that they had to endure. So I would recommend this one. It was funny and uplifting, but very sad and tragic at the same time. But it was well done. And Christopher Paul Curtis, I've never read a book of his that wasn't good. Um, and just, the other one. I'm just going to interrupt you and say I had the chance to meet Christopher Paul Curtis when I was working oh. at the Holton Lake Public Library. We wrote a grant. And he came and spoke at both the library and the schools there. Um, and he, as so many authors are, he's just um, incredible in person and is wonderful in talking with children about difficult subjects like um, slavery and racism and is able to do it in such a way that is direct and powerful and yet right where they can understand it, to learn to appreciate people for who they are and see them for who they are. So just just my one, you know, my one little, you know, I got to meet him. <laughs> I got, I well, got to I bet he to is. a school, you know. Like, so. I bet he okay. is because his stuff is so, so child appropriate, but yet it doesn't 
you know, whitewash everything, whitewash, I hate to say that, but um, it, it just, and I think he worked in a, one of the car factories in Flint. So yeah. how lucky we are that he found his true gift. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, the other one is Copper Sun, um, which I feel like, oh, I, I got a little too deep in the slavery issue, but um, this one deals with, um, it takes place in the 1700s. So we're not even close to ending um, this terrible institution yeah. called slavery, but um, it starts with Amari. She is a 15 year old in Africa. Um, her tribe, here's these um, white visitors that never seen white people have come and they decide to have a celebration and, you know, welcome these visitors and uh, the whole thing ends in uh, a slaughter of um, old people and children um, just so that they could get the, you know, the prime property that they want and being Amari and people around her age. So from the teens into the 20s, um, they're marched to the ocean and loaded on the ship and on the ship. Uh, and also Draper does the same as Curtis. Um, she talks about some terrible things, um, but it is still, this one's more appropriate for middle school, maybe sixth grade at the lowest. Um, but she doesn't go into the goriest of details or the, um, the sexual aspect of women were just property. Um, so on board the ship, Amari is just scared to death. She can't speak their language. Um, and there was an older woman on the ship that kind of comforts her um, in this terrible ride. They finally make it to America. Um, and it, it doesn't end well for a lot of them on board ship. Um, but anyway, when they get to America, um, at the same time Amari is being sold, to a slave owner, Mr. Derby, um, there is a white indentured servant girl, also 15 or 16, um, named Polly, who can read and write because her parents were indentured servants and they both died. Um, they both had a seven year contract for their indenture. And since they died of some disease, both of them, <coughs> Uh, Polly, at 15 years old, she has to be indentured for 14 years to make up for, you know, the parents' death. So um, she's looking at, you know, in her mind, that's old age back then. She's never going to have a life. And um, her family that had indentured her decides to sell her. You could sell them and give someone else her indenture. And Mr. Derby takes her and Amari at the same time. So Polly's a little bit prejudiced at first. Um, she's white, she's blonde, um, but she is thrown into the slave quarters to try to teach them English. Um, she's not treated much better than they are. Um, Mr. Derby purchased Amari as a gift for his son because it's his 16th birthday. So he gets Amari. And um, again, Draper doesn't go into the, you know, she's called to his bedroom, um, but the details are enough. I, I still think middle school students, um, they can handle this. So um, through it all, um, Mr. Derby and his son Clay proved to be just um, horrible, horrible people. And um, eventually Polly and Amari, um, oh, and Mr. Derby's wife is young. Um, he married her because his first wife died and this young wife has money. And so he gets her and all of her property and money. And she is the only um, shining light through the whole thing. Um, anyway, at a dinner where Amari is trying to serve the table, she accidentally trips and Mr. Derby um, proceeds to whip her right there in the dining room and it takes her weeks to heal from that. So the, the seed is planted in her mind. She needs to get out and Polly also wants out. Um, a very terrible thing happens and it's like the final straw. They're going to die if uh, they don't get out of there. Um, they had helped Mrs. Derby 
um, was something with another slave. So that is very violent, but again, um, those kind of things happened. So they escape. They have adventures along the way. Um, and in the meantime, they also take a little five or six year old little slave called Tidbit. His mom wants him gone because she's probably not going to end up well either after all that's happened. Um, so there they are helped off and on by people. And there is one slave, Cato, that seems to know the best way to escape and it's not to go north is to go south, which I had never heard of this. They are in the Carolinas and he tells them go south. No one will know that you've decided to go there. There is a place in St. Augustine that the Spanish own, which is also still there. It's called Fort Mose, M-O-S-E, but it's pronounced Mose. And the Spanish own this territory and uh, if you made it there, they would welcome slaves, anyone escaping the English. Um, you had to convert to Catholicism. That was the one thing they had to do. Um, but um, that place is also still there. I'd never known that there was a place they could go south. So it ends well. Um, there's tragedy, but there's hope all through the, the way. Um, I, I would recommend this one even to adults, but it's really good for. Uh, middle schoolers. I think um, it's good for them to see how it, it still amazes me that these kind of things people do to each other um, is just as mind boggling, but it happened. Um, it still happens some places in, in other ways. So I would recommend both. Um, and I think these, the stories of enslaved people and the horrors that they faced are so important that they get into the hands of as many people as possible um, at whatever age. I think it's important that we start talking about our history as a country with a lot more honesty. And I think that our literature does that better than our history books do. Yeah. So, and I think what literature and story can do that a history book can't is give you the chance to to see through somebody else's eyes and to see a perspective that we may never understand ever, but at least through literature and story, we have a chance of getting a glimpse and to start mm -hmm. to understand. So I think these are so, these are such important stories. You had said at the beginning, you're like, oh, I picked too many stories about slavery. I, I, those stories are so important. So I'm glad that you chose those. Thank you, Bonnie. Hi. Yep, thank you. Let's have, let's have Isabella go next. Oh, you're muted, Isabella. <laughs> it, un it unmuted for a moment and then. There you go. Um, so I chose all children's books um, and I'm a huge Kristen Robinson fan girl, like I said earlier. I just love uh, his illustrations. They tend to be kind of like uh, blockier and bright colors. Um, he does lots of uh, children's books about children and is very inclusive and includes all different types of kids from different backgrounds with different disabilities and just really paints like a beautiful picture of like our population as a whole. Um, he is a Caldecott Medal honoree as well as a Coretta Scott King Award honoree. Um, I've chose You Matter because it's one of my favorite books and it's just everybody matters. It's kind of like um, the Mr. Rogers book, It's You I Like. Mm -hmm. um, kind of reminded me of that. Um, and like I said, I got this from the bookmobile that we loaded up a couple years ago. And some of his other books that are so good as well are The Smallest Girl in the Smallest Grade. About this little girl who decides that, you know, we have to be kind to one another. So cute. Uh, Last Stop on Market Street. Uh, Leo, A Ghost Story, which was actually really cute. Um, little Penguins. Adorable. They're adorable penguins. There's two really cute books called Antimet and Gaston. And they're about these little dogs. And they're so cute. And Gaston's whole family are actually poodles. And he's like a French bulldog. 
and then Antoinette's family is all French Bulldogs, but she's kind of like a poodle. Uh, and they're adorable. They get mishaps. It's it just the illustration of it is just beautiful. Like they're just so well done. Um, and then he also has another book called Another, and it has no words in it. It's just all illustrations. And it's just about this adorable little girl that this world opens up and a cat comes in and then she just follows the cat out with her cat and you see this whole opposite world and it's adorable it's just the illustrations are just so cute I'm like seeing this background that i made i'm like ooh, maybe i can actually do this like <laughs> like maybe i'll just print out book covers and find it. um because it's so cute i think he's wonderful um he has a huge backlog of books that you can read um i enjoy them i enjoy them I don't know that my son even really sits down and looks at him with me while I read. I just kind of read to him while he just crawls around. He's only one. So. <laughs> he knows what's going on. Oh, yeah. I just got a comment on Gaston. Yeah. Because I love that book. And it gives me the opportunity to do a terrible French accent. Oh, ooh la la. Because one of the, one of the French ooh, poodles la, is named ooh la la. And also, my son has a stuffed French bulldog that he named Gaston because of that book. So we have a Gaston in our little stuffy family here at the Grineski household. Love it. There's Gaston singing in his, pink, in his little yellow yeah. He's so cute. Yeah, so cute. He's a wonderful, he's just, he's a great illustrator. Um, and then one of my other books I actually have with me is May Among the Stars. I don't know that you can actually see it unless I put it like on the face. Um, but so, I love this book. I was so excited when I saw that you chose it. I was like, yes, Man Among the Stars, so good. <laughs> yeah, so I had seen this floating around for quite a while. Um, and then my mother, she gets huge bags. I mean, I work for the library too, but my mother gets huge bags of books to bring home to my nephew and to my son. And this was stashed in there. I had never grabbed it for myself though. Um, and so I was reading it to my son while he was eating dinner one night, and I was like, oh my goodness, this book is so good. Um, and it's just about uh, little May. I, wait, it's actually about a real astronaut, I do believe. Um, yes, May Mae Jemison. Yeah. Dr. Mae Jemison. Yep. And so it's just about her as a little girl, and she wants to be an astronaut, but her teacher says, no, I think you might be a better nurse. And, but she doesn't give up and she becomes an astronaut and it's just written so well. Um, I loved it, super inspiring for all little people that want to be astronauts. Um, so yeah, that's adorable, super great story. And then my other book I also have with me too, Parker Looks Up, although you can't see us at all. Um, same background things we're in. Um, Parker looks up by Parker Curry and Jessica Curry, and it's adorable. These it looks like it's almost like a Disney book, like the illustrations. It's illustrated by Brittany Jackson, and it's about a little girl named Parker who is going on a play date, and they get to go to the National Portrait Gallery, and they're playing in the different galleries and looking at all the different art, and they replicate different art pieces like Degas. And I believe there's like some water lilies. Um, and then she, it's time to go, but all of a sudden she looks up and there's the beautiful portrait of Michelle Obama. And she realizes that, you know, she can do anything. Like she just feels so inspired by this amazing portrait. Um, and it's just the little the illustration of her just like looking up at Michelle Obama. It's just, it makes my heart just, melt into happiness every single time and it's adorably illustrated it's a wonderful story um just about knowing that you can do anything like when you have like the inspiration in your life you can do anything and the ending i'm looking at the ending picture of her then walking in the beautiful dress the <laughs> i would show it to you but my zoom doesn't let me i'll try it because did yeah i was gonna say didn't her her family have a dress like Michelle Obama's made for her. Oh, uh, yeah, she's on the back in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I just think that's so sweet. Just supporting those dreams and yeah, yeah. and representation matters. Yeah. You know, having going into the National Portrait Gallery and seeing a first lady that looks like you, that looked like Parker. I mean, 
And I want to say, and it's been a while since I've looked at the book, that when she saw it, she looked up and asked if she was a queen. Yes. You know, it it, it matters that she walked in there and saw Michelle Obama. And it's going to matter for somebody else someday when they walk in and see the vice president is Kamala Harris. So, if and I it's a beautiful, this adorable on, book. This is based on like a true thing too, right? Wasn't there like a really cool picture with the little girl? Yeah, there's the photograph is out yeah. from her that they took when they visited. This is amazing. It really is. So thank you, Isabella. Those are all great choices. All right. And let's have Kelly share her books. I know you probably saved me for last because you know I'm going to talk a lot about Jason Reynolds. <laughs> Jason Reynolds and, and Kadir Nelson. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know. Um, so I'll start with Jason Reynolds. So like I said, I met him at a conference years and years and years ago, and nobody really knew who he was yet. Like he was just um, kind of breaking the scene. Um, but yeah, when he talks, like you just hang on every words. And I, the, the thing that most attracted me to him was the way that he described readers, um, young readers. I was a youth services librarian and our technician. And, you know, it's so hard to try and get kids to read and it's a passion of mine. You know, I, when kids say, oh, I don't like reading, I find that as a challenge and I'm like, okay, but I just think that you don't have the right book. And so I, I find that as a challenge to find the right book for them to, to get hooked. Um, and the way that he talks like that, like it was just mesmerizing. Every kid should read what they want. We need to stop pushing, you know, all this stuff down their throats and just let them explore and read what they want. And he referred to um, himself as a child. I read everything I could get my hands on. And he's like, even lyrics, you know, like in the cassette tapes where they had the open, you know, the magazines. He said, when I would get a new cassette, I would open it up and I would just read the lyrics. And I was Queen Latifah when I read the lyrics. Like they just were just amazing. Um, but I just love him and his passion um, for young kids and readers. And um, it, he's just amazing. So if you first, if you listen to this and I and he sounds intriguing anyway, please start with his website because his about section is amazing. And um, it will give you an idea of his writing style and just him as a person. But um, I'm going to talk about two books and I promise I won't try. I won't talk about them super long. But <laughs> the first one I'll start with is um, A Long Way Down. And um, it's a young adult book, definitely um, high school reading level. Um, but the main character is Will and his brother, Sean, was just murdered. Um, drive by murdered on the sidewalk. He was there. His mother was there. The neighborhood was there. Um, he goes home and he remembers the three rules that Sean taught him. Don't cry. Don't snitch. Seek revenge. Um, he shares a room with his brother Sean and he sees a drawer that's open and inside the drawer is a gun and Will decides he needs to follow the rules. He's not going to cry. He's not going to snitch because he thinks he knows who killed his brother and he's going to get revenge. So the next morning he gets up and um, he gets on the elevator um, and it's 9.08. He gets to the sixth floor and a gentleman walks in. And when he realizes who it is, he realizes it's, it's Buck. And Buck um, has been murdered. It's He's a family friend. Um, he's somebody that him and his brother looked up to. And so now Will is really freaked out. What the heck is going on? Um, I want to pause right here and say that this whole book is written in verse. And like Tony, I am not, when I see books that are in verse, I immediately am like, no, because poetry is not my thing. It's it's not. Um, but the way that he writes this and the reason why he writes it is awesome. And it's mind blowing. And I don't think that this story would work if it wasn't written in verse. It's so quick and to the point. Um, it's amazing. So he's in the elevator. He's on the sixth floor. It's 908. He sees Buck. He's talking to him um and then the elevator stops again and this girl gets on and he's like oh dang look at this girl she's so cute well then he realizes it's his childhood friend um from elementary school who got shot on the playground and he saw her die there so um they're talking and she is telling him who she is and he's like what the heck is going on um so the elevator goes down again it's 908 still um and his uncle Mark gets on the elevator who was also murdered um, by a drive-by shooting. And so uncle Mark gets on and they're talking and 
but all three of them now are just trying to get Will to come to terms on what's going on and try to make him see that what he's doing is not really a great idea. Um, as they continue down, it's still 9.08. Uh, his dad gets on the elevator and his dad was murdered as well, um, seeking revenge for the murder of his um, his brother. So this all goes on and the, the time is the same. And this this is when the verse comes in because when you're on an elevator, everything happens so quick, right? Like you don't really have time to do anything. Like, you know, even your thoughts are um, fragmented, you know, like you get on the elevator and you have to think about a floor and then you're on the floor and then you have. So the way that the verse is written it is like amazing because there's so much that Will is going through and so much that's going through his head. The time's not changing. It fits perfect. Um, for the for this story so it's 909 and um frick gets on the elevator and frick is the person who murdered buck which was the family friend who originally got on the elevator and you soon find out that frick was murdered by sean which is will's brother and at 909 sean enters and sean doesn't say anything he just is crying and Will's like I followed the rules I didn't cry um, I'm not a snitch and I'm, I'm gonna do the third rule and Sean just is crying and crying and then um, he he gets to the end and it's 9 oh it's 9 10 and the elevator stops and he walks out of the elevator and so from there the reader has to decide did he follow own path and break the cycle right there of all the people that were in the elevator that were all connected by this idea of revenge um murdering killing so at the end of the book i listened to it which i highly recommend because jason reynolds narrates it which i love when an author narrates their book because the characters come alive they know exactly where to put the attitude and the personality um and he hits it everywhere um but at the end they have an interview with him and he says he wrote the book it, it's an idea that he's had for a long time and it's basically boys in the hood and christmas carol all coming together and i was like oh my gosh that's i didn't even think of it that way but that's a perfect way but he said the verse was intentional for the elevator the quick thoughts and he's like and in everyday life you don't think in full sentences you think in fragmented um sentences you know like it's not i'm walking down the sidewalk it's Kelly walk, you know, or I, I'm, I walk the sidewalk or, you know, so that verse was very important to tell the story. And he says, um, this is what I love about him. He says, I never write books to teach lessons. I write books to give empathy. And so he, he travels around to a lot of detention centers. He said he went to one in California and there were tons of just young adults in these detention centers that were part of different gangs. There's two different gangs. And it was a beef that started in 1960 over a pair of shoes. And these kids are still fighting each other because of it, because it's all they know. So he said it's easy for people to pass judgments as voyeurs. And so he said my my goal and my idea is to bring empathy to those groups and to say like this is this is kind of a glimpse in, into the, into the world. So, which leads me to my next book that he wrote, which is one of my favorites and one of the first ones that I read of him. So um, it's called When I Was Young, or I'm sorry, When I Was the Greatest. And the main character in this one, his name is um, Ali. Alan is his name, but his family and all of his friends call him Ali. He has been um, boxing with a local boxer since he was super, super young. Um, his mom kind of hooks him up there so that he would have a, a good role model to follow by and just give him something to do to kind of stay out of trouble. He has a younger sister named Jazz and his mom who works two jobs. She's a social worker during the day and then she works at a department store at night. His dad's kind of MIA. He kind of got um, into some things, spent some time in jail, um, but nothing like with drugs or um, killing or anything. He just liked to hoist things and then resell them for money. So his mom was like, nope, you're out. So his dad comes back here and there, but um, and, and they have a good relationship. It's just, you know, his parents are separated. And so one day um, next door, they have a really nice brownstone. There's an older couple that live there. They decide to move to Florida and it kind of goes to crap. They have like drug addicts and prostitutes that end up living there until one day he sees a kid sitting on the stoop and he walks over and introduces himself and they become friends. Um, his name is Noodles, they call him. Um, his real name is, I think it's uh, Ronald, I think, or I forget what his real name is because they just refer to him as a street name. So Noodles is his name and it's his little sister's the one that gave him to him. Noodles' mom is, she's, 
irresponsible and you know she is always gone and is never there noodles has a brother named needles um and he has the syndrome he has Tourette syndrome so he has um violent outbursts he will just stand on the stoop cussing um and the thing is with the neighborhood everyone there is very supportive they all know what's going on they don't think of him any differently but noodles is very very protective of him so if people stand and stare too long you know he gets very agitated and on edge and tries to create trouble one thing um that they figure out though um Ali's mom, Doris, because she's a social worker, has a background with these um, with with needles and his condition. So one day needles is out having a really bad fit and she runs inside and grabs needles and a ball of yarn and she tells needles she shows him how to knit and it keeps needles busy so that his outbursts are few. So instead of having verbal outbursts every once in a while, he'll just have a jerk and the the knots will come undone and he'll keep going. So it keeps him busy. So that's how he gets his name needles is the knitting needles. So the three of them are pretty tight. They go everywhere together. Um, well, they find out um, that this girl that Noodles is into, Tasha, her brother throws these huge parties. Like everyone's invited. It's the, the end all be all of parties. And they find out she works the door. So they ask her if she, they can go to the party. And she's like, yeah, sure, if you bring Needles. And they were like, oh, that's kind of tricky. But um, Ali talks them into it, talks Noodles and Needles into it, and they end up going. They get some really nice clothes from um, Ali's dad, who, you know, steals them and then sells them again, but, you know, hooks them up. So they go to this party, and when they're there, they end up splitting up. Noodles is talking to the girl that he likes. Needles is in the corner with a doing his thing, and then Ali ends up leaving with a girl down the hall. All of a sudden, things happen. There's a huge fight. Ali walks out and Needles is getting the crap beat out of him. And his brother Noodles is just standing there, not even defending him. So Ali goes in, uses his training and beats all these guys up. Um, from there is when the coming, like the togetherness and the growing as friendship and grownups happens. Like it's amazing. So they, you know, Ali's upset with Noodles that he didn't defend his brother and all of this stuff kind of comes together. Um, Ali's dad has to come and um, help him and save him. And it's just an amazing story with a great ending and a story of reflection. You know, I think a lot of young people anywhere, <laughs> they think that they're the center of attention and they're big and bad and, you know, they do what they want. And this story is how you can't do everything on your own and you're not the center of attention. And, you know, you need other people to help. He thinks he's the center of attention. <laughs> Are you kidding me? The look on his face was just like, I got you. Oh my gosh. So it's just, a, it's a really great story. I don't want to give too much away because that's when the story kind of turns um, and you learn more about the characters. So, um, but it was amazing. So I'm going to stop there before I talk anymore because I seriously could talk about Jason Reynolds all day long. So the illustrator I chose was Kadir Nelson. I He's amazing. I also found out about him at a conference that we went to. Um, uh, Blue Sky White Stars is the book that I first read that was illustrated by him. Um, and it's amazing. Like the story alone um, is amazing, but his illustrations tie everything in. So it's, um, it's a, uh, a book about togetherness and one nation and what I love about this is so she the author um I'm gonna butcher her name so I'm not even gonna say it um because it's a mouthful but um the the book she writes she goes back and forth so it's like the the illustration that was just on said stand proud um stand proud so it's the civil war and then you know um i think that's civil war maybe not um and then you know she's standing at the podium with the graduation um it the the illustrations i mean look he just brings them to life everything about him all american all american sewn together one nation sewn together one nation like it you see the face like they look like photographs to me like it just brings everything together so he started painting and he, his medium is oil painting and he has always shown an interest in art since he was three years old and his uncle who's an artist told his mom watch him because he's going to go somewhere and so he kind of took Kadir under his wing and taught him about shading and light and what to do and how to do it 
and um, he just kept going with it. He actually ended up um, going to college at Pratt for architecture because he had so many friends who um, said that, you know, it's hard to get a job. You're going to be a starving artist. And so he went through architecture, but he just it wasn't really his thing. And he ended up finding his way back to art. And he's done a great deal of things reading up on him like he um, illustrated the cover for Drake's album. I forget what it's called. Anyways, um, and, and he did a Michael Jackson album cover right before Michael Jackson passed away. He was working with him on that. Um, but he said, I always think, um, oh, nothing was the same. That's Drake's title, his album that he did. But he always says what he, when he illustrates books, he tries to think about his illustrations without words, that illustrations and words are a marriage and they bring the story together. So I think that that's like an awesome, um, an awesome pairing and an awesome way to think of things, right? Like you need to make sure that you're, illustrations fit without even the words. So um, the other book that I picked too, The Undefeated, it's written by Kwame um, Alexander, which I, I was like, eh, I don't want to overwhelm you guys with all, all my gushing. So The Undefeated by Kwame Alexander is um, also illustrated by Kadir Nelson. And again, Kwame Alexander is amazing. His words are awesome. He writes, um, usually just verse and so this book is an amazing book um in verse about the challenges and the risings of the african americans but kadir nelson's um illustrations just bring it all together i do i have illustrations on here yeah okay, i thought i did yeah, and again this was really hard to say like oh here's the illustration i want you to do but like look at the lighting and the shading like it just blows my mind and it just really brings in the emotion um in three like it's just amazing and um blue sky white stars in the back like at the at the front of the um cover it's their fireworks going off but you can't tell until you look at the back of the book and you can see the fireworks but when you go back to the front you can see the light of the fireworks reflected on their faces which i mean it's just amazing the detail that he puts into this so could you now send I love him too. I want to have dinner with him too. His work is amazing and he's been it really recently on several um, magazine covers. Yes. I can't New remember Yorker. which ones. I want to say GQ. Um, there's Nash. I don't know. I'm going to get it wrong. So yeah. And I know he's done they're beautiful and gorgeous. Yeah. Like his website is amazing too. Go check his stuff out because he's got a lot of his work and a lot of his independent stuff and he has stuff for sale on there too. So yeah, I can't afford that. Yeah, I can't either, but <laughs> a girl can dream, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. And for my books, um, I'm going to talk about the amazing James McBride first. And before I get into the Good Lord Bird, I'm going to give a really quick shout out to The Color of Water, which is his, He the subtitle says, it is a black man's tribute to his white mother. And his mother, Ruth McBride Jordan, in reading this book, she's incredible. Um, she is the mother of 12 children. She made sure every single one of them went to college. They all graduated. And many of them also went through graduate school. And she herself, at age 65, received a degree in social work from Temple University. Um, she's not messing around. She was going to make sure her children did the best that they could with the gifts that they had, no matter what stood in their way. Um, she herself was the daughter of a failed itinerant Orthodox rabbi, and she was born in Poland on April 1st, 1921. Her family fled Poland and the um, what was happening there came to America and settled in Virginia. And then The Color of Water tells her story. And the title comes from, I think one of the children asked her, what color is God? And her answer, and I love this, is that God is the color of water. And, and it, it like, God and the idea of God transcends color. Um, it includes all color. God reflects all color. I just, I think that's amazing. So pick it up. The audiobook's fabulous. It is actually done in multiple voices. Um, 
it, it's it's amazing. Um, so two thumbs up for Color of Water. I'll stop talking about that. Move on to the Good Lord Bird, um, which I strongly recommend listening to. The audiobook is fabulous. It is read. The narrator is Michael Boatman, who is an actor who's been in stuff, but I couldn't tell you what stuff. But he's amazing on this audiobook. So Michael Boatman as a narrator, pick it up. So I'm going to use kind of the book's overview. So it, it is a fictional story, but based in a lot of history. And there is a historical note at the end that tells you this is the stuff that's real. Here's the stuff that isn't. And it tells the story of Onion, a enslaved boy who is disguised as a girl for most of the book. And I'm not going to tell you how that happens because it's funny and a little bit worrying and it tugs at your heart, but it happens. And so he's disguised as a girl and he ends up as a part of John Brown's army. And if you don't remember John Brown, because I didn't remember a lot except, hey, he was an abolitionist. Like literally, if somebody had asked me about John Brown, that's what I could have told you. Um, he is complicated and funny and possibly a little bit off his rocker, but he believed deeply that slavery was wrong and it needed to end now. He was not one of those who said, well, maybe we could do it gradually or maybe we could do it this way or somehow it had to happen slowly. He was, it needs to end now because it's wrong. There's no two ways about this. And he believed in that deeply enough that he raised an army to go out and fight and release enslaved people. Um, so Onion ends up with John Brown and most of the book is them traveling through the country on these raids to, to free people. Um, and then the book ends with the raid on Harper's Ferry, which again, if you had asked me, what's the raid on Harper's Ferry? I would have said, well, I know they lost. Like, that's all I could have told you. Literally, like, that would have been it. It's so, this book is so exciting. It has you on the edge of the seat. Even if you know how it's going to end, that almost makes it more exciting because you want to start pulling the characters back and go, this isn't going to work. So the raid on Harper's Ferry, they were trying to get ammunition. Um, and then they were going to take that ammunition, give it to the free enslaved people. And then they were going to raise up a greater army and the rebellion was going to begin then. And holy cow in the book, it, I, like I didn't want to stop listening. You know, it's one of those books where I'm sitting in the driveway going, no, no, no. Like you just, Oh, and then afterwards I went out and read about the history of it because I was like, well, how much of that was true? Holy cow. It it could have changed the history of the United States as we know it if just a few things had gone differently. And I'm sure there's a lot of points in history that are like that. But um, so the Good Lord Bird, um, it's great for just the listening propulsive power that it has. It's great because it's funny. It's great because it is sharing a perspective on history that I didn't have before. I give it all the thumbs up. And if I was an award giving person, I would give it all the awards as well. And it has won several. I'm not sure exactly what it's won. I didn't write that down. Um, and then his most recent book is Deacon King Kong. And I cannot speak to that because I haven't read that one yet. But I believe in James McBride, and I'm betting that whatever he does is going to be amazing. So Deacon King Kong is on my list as well. The other illustrator, I chose an illustrator for my other one, is Jerry Pinkney. And Jerry Pinkney is amazingly talented, and he has been illustrating children's books for over 40 years. He has more than 75 books that he has done. And he has also received five Caldecott Honor Awards, and he won the Caldecott Medal for the book that I'm going to talk about, The Lion and the Mouse. 
and I'm going to take my screen away and then I'm going to try and get rid of my background here so I can show my book, but I'm not seeing how I can go about doing that, which makes me sad. So I guess I won't. Um, so you're not going to be able to see this. Oh, it actually is kind of showing up. So there's the cover of the lion and the mouse. And look at that cover. Like there aren't even any words on it. It's just this giant, amazing lion face and that expression on there. See, I move. So if I just stay right here, I won't move. The expression on there is amazing. Um, and he takes the traditional fable of the lion and the mouse, sets it in the African Serengeti. And all of the illustrations are amazing. He tends to do mostly fairy tales, folk tales, and traditional fables. That's what he's sort of known for illustrating. But he does amazing human faces, and I love his animal faces. I'm trying to find the one where the poor, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to get this up there so that you can, oh, I can. That poor lion gets caught by hunters on the plains and gets trapped in this rope trap. And that face, I just love that face. And then the little mouse is there. And the whole book is entirely wordless. So it's really one that you want to have children sitting right next to you so you can look at it together and really explore the illustrations and ask them what they think the story is and what's happening here and, and what do you think that lion's thinking right now and what about this mouse do you think the mouse is scared so he's he just does fabulous amazing artwork and i love the expanse of it i don't know how to describe that lion's face any better but i just love it and if I could get a lion face hung in my house like that, I would. So, all right. So thank you everybody for sharing your books with us. Um, thank you to those who listened. Next week, we are going to be talking about books with characters that you would want for your best friend. So we will be sharing those next week. And we hope that you have a great week if you're listening to this. Um, right now we're recording pre-Valentine's Day, so have fabulous Valentine's Day. And we're recording pre-President's Day. So if you do something cool for President's Day, enjoy that too. If you get the day off, because the libraries will be closed, we hope that you enjoy your long weekend as well. Thank you so much. Bye.